Thanks. Thank you, it was very kind. I'll, I'll see if I can uh, make the next hour of your time worth it. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about the path towards impeccable Rust. And, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means, what all the words in that sentence actually mean. But, but the general sense here is that Rust is now being used increasingly in critical software. And when I say critical here, what I mean is like high stakes, life and livelihood on the line kind of work. That could be life-saving uh, medical equipment. It could be linchpin financial services. It could be situational awareness or like urgent, um, urgent countermeasures in war zones. It could be low margin for error control systems like nuclear reactors or space shuttles or even cars, right? So we have a talk, I think, uh, later today on Renault who wants to sell cars being an example of, of this kind of Rust use in critical uh, systems. And remember, this is where we want Rust to be. Right? We have said that we believe, and I, I'll use the, the sort of royal we here, uh, that, that we want Rust to be in these critical systems we, because we believe that it has properties that makes this the right place to use Rust. Rust has unique things that we think makes it the right tool for doing this successfully. Um, so let me, let me go back to the words of the title. So I'm saying towards here because it's impossible to reach perfection. Right? It is just not feasible in any way. Uh, but we should strive to get close. It's sort of like security, where the goal here is the journey, and there is no real destination for you to get to. And, and when I say impeccable, I don't mean that impeccable software can't fail. There are all sorts of reasons why software might fail. It could be operator errors. It could be hardware errors. Uh, it could be failures in the spec, like the software follows the spec, but the spec is not the right one. What I want to use here is impeccable in the definition of free from fault or blame. So it is not the software's fault. That does not mean that nothing goes wrong, but at least the software is not to blame. So what does impeccable mean then? It, it means that the software is dependable. It means that it's misuse resistant. It means that it's ergonomic. It means that it's fast enough. And in this talk, I'm going to talk you through some of the ways in which you can use Rust to achieve that. As you might say, the sort of subtitle of this talk is really signs you're doing it right, like a bunch of things that are good ideas or might be tools or techniques that could be useful to you. It is not an exhaustive list. So who am I in this? Um, my name is John. Uh, I, I promise so I have less hair now than this picture, and it's not because of my strive for impeccable rust. It is just a side effect of time. Um, I do a bunch of things, um, but my day, day job at the moment is as a principal engineer at Helsing. Um, we have a hackathon running downstairs that so you should come check out. It's pretty cool. Um, if you don't know who Helsing is, Helsing is a software-only defense AI company, and we build software where real-time operation, resilience, and reliability are non-negotiable features of the software, uh, where all of our operating environments are hostile and adversarial, and where the margin for error is minuscule and the consequences of failure are truly dire. Um, and, and we do all of this primarily in Rust. That was an intentional choice. And, and since I started at Helsing, a big part of my focus has been on maintaining a high quality of bar for the Rust code across the company, often simply by just showing up to random teams, looking through their code, talking through some of the things that I'm about to tell you in this presentation, and then digging into how can we make the software they build more reliable. Beyond my day job, I also am the author of Rust for Stations, which is a book on sort of intermediate and advanced Rust. Uh, and I also do a bunch of Rust education work and open source work. The, the book right there, yeah, that's right. Um, so hopefully this sort of sets the scene for why at least this is, I know some of the stuff of this thing. Um, so let's dig into it. The first thing I want you to take away from this, and maybe the main thing to take away from the talk, is that there is no single trick. There is no one thing that you can do to make your code impeccable. Instead, there are a number of techniques, tools, and telltale signs that you should keep track of in your code bases. We'll go over some of these here, but it's not an exhaustive list, and there never will be such a list. This space is constantly evolving. We're getting new tools. We're discovering new techniques, and that's OK. Um, also, doing all of the things that I'm about to talk to is expensive. It is costly, it is hard, it is time consuming. Choose where to spend your budget, and I don't mean that just in a monetary sense, but your time budget, your people resources, all of it. Choose how to spend your risk budget among these things. For those who are already familiar with my style, um, I won't go over the details of everything here. This is not a sort of dive deep on one topic kind of talk. I'm going to give a survey of a bunch of things that are useful for you to know about, and then the hope is that you can go dig into them on your own and learn from better resources than me about any particular one. 
Let's start with testing. And you knew that this was coming, right? There's no doubt that the testing is one of the tools that we use here. But I'm hoping to highlight some aspects of testing that become particularly relevant in these high stakes situations, or especially in adversarial situations. You should know about all of these. You don't necessarily need to use all of them. But if you're not using them, you should have a good reason not to. And you know, why testing matters you know, is obviously because of correctness. How else do you know that your code works? But it's also things like avoiding regressions, making sure that you match requirements, that you match spec. But it could also be for legibility, for documentation for others, so that they understand how your code is supposed to work and can see examples of how to use it. The first part here is be paranoid. Just because your tests pass does not mean your code is not broken, right? The tests only test what they've written to be, and even then, it's not clear they actually test what you think they do. You want to assert everything throughout your code base. Any assumption that you make in your software, have an assertion for. And we'll get back to some of the reasons why that is important, but you really want to be defensive here and make sure that anything you assume is true is checked. There are also a bunch of tools here that help you catch things that look like they work correctly, but are not guaranteed to continue to do so. Miri is sort of the tool that we know best here. This is a, a Rust-specific tool that executes your Rust code, it interprets your Rust code, and it keeps track of the actual behavior of your program behind the scenes and looks for things that are undefined behavior, things that might work correctly now, they might happen to get the right result, but they are not guaranteed to continue to work in exactly that way. Even if nothing panics, Miri will tell you this pattern is not okay. And then there are sanitizers, which are a, a simpler version or, or a more general purpose version, maybe, that work across languages. They're not quite as good as tracking down exactly all the problematic patterns. But the nice thing is that they work across language boundaries because they are agnostic to what language you're using. They're just tracking things like um, threading, memory access patterns, uh, memory allocations and deallocations, that kind of stuff. These are very useful tools to know about. These are things like address sanitizer, thread sanitizer, leak sanitizer, and so on. The next step is, and, and I want to actually take a moment for this, like write tests for things that don't work. And what I mean by that is if you have in your code something that returns an error, if you don't have a test that checks that that error is actually yielded, then the, what that means is if someone comments out that return error, your code would still appear to work fine even though it's now ignoring some error condition. You need to test for all of your error cases so that you ensure that in future refactors, those errors are still returned under the same conditions. As a litmus test here, if you replaced all of your return error with like continue, if all your tests still pass, you have a problem. The next step here is to embrace chaos. The, the good old adage here goes, anything that can go wrong will go wrong and will do so at the worst possible time. And this gets back to the fact that um, when you write tests, you're only testing specifically the things that you listed out, which is usually the things that you know about. But in reality, the way that software often fails are all the ways you didn't think of. And this is where anything in the sort of rough realm of chaos testing really comes in. There are a bunch of ways in which you can do chaos testing. You can do chaos testing on execution. You can do chaos testing on uh, inputs. And you can do chaos testing on what I'll call logic. And I'll get back to that one in a second. Execution is about you have a piece of code, you have some input, but there are a bunch of ways in which that code might actually execute. So this could be things like you have you know, your OS level scheduler might choose the threads run in a particular order, or your asynchronous runtime might choose to run futures in a particular order. And what that order is changes how your code behaves and might cause it to exhibit erroneous behavior. And what these tools do, so Turmoil being one for, for asynchronous code, Shuttle being one for synchronous code, is they sort of control the scheduler and just try to make sure that lots of interesting threading patterns or future execution patterns are exercised to maximize the chance that you hit some of those weird boundary conditions. For inputs, this is more like, you know, if you just provide a single input to your test, you're only testing the behavior under that input. But in reality, you really want to explore the input space. It could be that your code only panics if the input is 42. Well, if you don't have a test that is 42, you have a problem. So chaos testing for inputs is really just giving a way to construct random or semi-random inputs, and then checking that the system still has some correctness properties as a result. The simplest connection, uh, correct, ah, the simplest, uh, correctness property uh, is that the code doesn't panic. 
But in reality, this is one of the reasons why to have a lot of assertions is that you get more panics when something goes wrong. But you can also do more things than just check whether your code panics. You could do things like imagine you're implementing your own hash map. You could have a, uh, an input test like this where you have your code's hash map. You also have the hash map from the standard library. You generate an input, which might be a sequence of inserts and removes. And then you send those inputs, those commands, in the same order to your hash map and to the standard library hash map. And the output of this is you check whether the two maps are the same at the end. That should also be a correctness property that you can check. And the idea with these, with quick check and with prop test, and also just general fuzzing libraries, is they just generate lots of inputs that are somewhat random in order to explore the state space of your inputs and figure out inputs that might lead to uh, erroneous behavior. And this last one is really interesting. So logic chaos, and, and I only know of one tool that does this, which is cargo mutants. Logic chaos is the idea that there is another thing that matters, which is your code. And there are really interesting things you can do when you have a test suite that you know should be exhaustive, which is you take your code, and then you make small modifications to it, and you check that a test actually fails as a result. So what, this, what Cargo Mutants does is it takes your source code, and then it looks for things like minus 1 or plus 1 in if conditions, and then it switches the sign or it removes that minus one, or it moves to plus one, and then it sees if a test fails. And if no test fails as a result of changing a boundary condition, that means your tests are insufficient. Because this was an a very easily uh, reached error condition that you don't have a test for. And so it basically exercises whether your test suite is good enough by chaos testing. It's a really neat tool. There are some other sort of commercial tools, like there's a startup called uh, Antithesis that has a tool that deterministically chaos runs through your application and lets you look through those, the, the execution traces so that you can easily reproduce failures as well when they happen. I haven't used it myself, but I've heard good things. Um, but in general, like, you never run out of things that can go wrong. <laughs> so just keep testing. The follow-on to this is to be exhaustive. And this comes with a caveat, because it's only where you can. Let me explain. So think of a one in a million bug, or a one in a billion bug. right? Like you have a U64, and like only the number 800,473 will panic. If you do chaos testing on a U64, you might never hit that number. And so you never realize that that particular code path is wrong. So you need something that's more structured here. You need something that understands that it either needs to exercise every possible like, path, every possible execution. And that's exactly what these tools do. So what they will do is, either in the input domain or in the execution domain, make sure that every possible distinguishable execution happens. Let's look at this from the, the point of view of um, threads. So Loom is a, a crate in the Rust library and the Rust ecosystem that uh, will sort of replace all of your std thread imports. You replace them with Loom thread instead, uh, just for the purposes of testing. And what it will do is it will run a simple test that you write. It will run it as many times as there are possible interleavings of those threads. So if you write a Loom test that has two threads, that like read and write a variable, for example, it will take every possible interleaving of the executions of those threads and run them. So that means a really simple looking test case can take hours to run because it checks every permutation of thread interactions. This also means that Loom is only really suited for cases where you don't have too many possible interleavings. You want your tests to be relatively simple because you don't need them to be complicated. The, all of the sort of exhaustiveness and the, the uh, complicated parts of testing when you write like loops that just try a bunch of times to see if something fails is handled in the, test, in the testing tool itself so your tests can remain simple. But it only really works for core primitives. You would not usually take your whole application and run it with Loom. It would take far too long. There are too many possible thread interleaving points. And instead, you just take the core sort of synchronization primitive data structure, run that through Loom. Uh, and then for your larger application test, you use something else. Connie is an example of something that does the same, but in the input domain. So the idea here is, uh, let me show you uh, a code example here. Imagine you have code like this. Right? So if x is 9,000, then you panic. For any other case, you print. If you tried to chaos this, this, you would probably never hit the panic. What Connie will do is it does what's known as symbolic execution. So it runs your program once with, let's say, x here was symbolic. It runs your program once with 
x being set to 0, just some standard default value. And then instead of just executing the code, it actually interprets the code, and it looks at all of the conditionals that x goes through in that execution of the program. And then, it, let's say it you know, picked x equals 0, so it's going to execute the print line branch. And at this point, what it will do is realize, OK, one of the conditionals that x went through was a check for x equals to 0, which was false. And so then it will try to solve using an SMT solver, sort of a tool to solve symbolic um, mathematical formulas, and say, give me an x such that x equals 9,000 is true instead of false. And out of that falls, x equals 9,000. This can get really complicated for complicated if expressions, and you need to sort of have the entire path down the tree. But what it means is Connie can actually look at your code, look at the execution of your code, and realize that the only two inputs that matter are x equals 0 and x equals 9,000. It does not need to run any others, because those are the only branches in your program. This is really cool. Uh, it is really hard. It takes a really long time for any program that has, you know, calls to the standard library that might have if conditions internally, for loops, like those are if conditions, so it gets complicated there too. You want to keep your test cases simple, but it's a very powerful tool to exhaustively test your software. And again, you use this for like the, the core primitives um, of, uh, or the kernels of your software, if you will. Uh, and, and in general, I would especially recommend using these for anything that has concurrent access, unsafe code, anywhere where you know like bugs are likely to be is where these tools shine. OK, let's then move on from testing for a bit, because testing is only part of the story. The next thing I want to talk about is benchmarks. Um, and, and you might think that, oh, benchmarks only matter if you want things to go fast, but that's not quite true. Anything that isn't tracked somehow is going to regress. It's going to get worse over time. And benchmarks regressions, like when things get slower or use more memory, sure, they're expensive, they're painful to users, but they can also mean critical failures. So if you think about these sort of low or very like slim tolerance kinds of systems, systems with like embedded devices with limited memory, if you use too much memory, your process gets killed with the, by the OOM killer, and now your process doesn't run anymore and the software probably fails. If your software isn't fast enough, it might not keep up with the inputs. So it's a lagging behind, and now you're not reacting to real-time information anymore. Maybe your system is on the critical path to some user interaction where they only have like a second to do something or three seconds to do something. Well, if your system now has a latency of four seconds, you don't work anymore in that context. So tracking these things is super important, because otherwise they will get worse. Um, here, the, the first rule, so to speak, is to know thyself. And sort of like with testing, you want to capture the entire performance profile of your program, not just the easy common path, not just the simple case. You want to exercise all of the parts of your, your performance profile that matter to the user. That means pathological cases. Like the cases that you know are slow, you want to make sure don't get any slower. If you look at, for example, the memcar um, crate in the Rust ecosystem that does just, it searches for a string in a larger string. It's a very useful primitive. It has a giant benchmarking suite of these are things that we know our current algorithm are slow at. If we get faster at them, that's great, but these are the ones we acknowledge we're slow at, and we just don't want to get any slower. You want to have micro and macro benchmarks. So that means you want to benchmark so that the individual components don't get slower uh, or use more memory or whatever it might be. But you also want end-to-end -end tests to capture the entire workflow that you care about. You want to benchmark both under, at, and over capacity. So what I mean by that is you want to make sure under capacity, like if the system is not being loaded to its maximum capacity, that you're not like using four CPU cores to do very little work. At capacity is just checking to make sure that you can actually tolerate the kind of load you expect to see. And over capacity is to make sure that if you supply the system with more input, more requests than it was designed to handle, it doesn't fall over. Ideally, when the system hits capacity, it should sort of flatten out the, the performance that you get. But for some systems, what we see is that as you increase the amount of supplied load, the system actually crashes and sort of tanks its performance because it spends all of its work doing throwaway work. And so these things are important to measure. And, and finally, you have to do these benchmarks on all of the targets that matter. 
So it doesn't really matter what your performance results are on some beefy Linux machine and CI with like an x86 processor if you're deploying to like a tiny Raspberry Pi, right? Those benchmark results are not representative where you're going to run your workload. Do you really want the benchmarks to be representative of what matters? Ultimately, you should think of this as, are your benchmarks useful? If they tell you that something got slower or faster, does that correspond to something that the actual users of your software cares about? And similarly, do you hear problems being reported by your users that weren't caught by your benchmarks? Because if so, that indicates that you're missing benchmarks that are relevant to them. The next part here is to have trustworthy measurements. You really want to have your CI be able to fail on regressions. And getting to this state is really hard. It sounds easy, but there is so much noise in benchmarking, at least in the traditional senses that we do it, that usually it's just like a warning box, like maybe your CI turns yellow instead of green, but you can still merge the, the PR. That's fine, but it's not good enough. You need to strive for more than this so that the, the benchmarks actually ensure that there aren't regressions. There are a couple of rules of, of uh, thumb here. The first of them is to not use time. Time is generally a terrible thing to measure for benchmarks. And that means both like how many seconds did it take to do this workload, but it also means how many operations per second can I get. And the reason for this is because the absolute performance of your system in terms of things it can do per second depend on a lot of different factors. It can depend on things like the temperature in the room or what other things are running at the machine at the same time or even just what microcode updates does the CPU have. And all of those things are not really the things you wanted to measure, and they add to the noise of your system. There are a bunch of other things you can measure instead, things like the number of instructions executed, which is independent of how fast they were executed, the number of cycles, which is a little more noisy but corresponds better to wall clock time. But you want some measure that is less noisy but corresponds to how long it actually takes to run. So in number of instructions is usually a good thing to use here. This is also what Rust-C does for their own benchmarks um, for exactly this reason. Um, there are some tools to help here. One of the ones I know of in the Rust ecosystem is uh, IAI CallGrind, which, which runs, it through, uh, runs your benchmarks through Valgrind, which can actually measure the exact instruction counts for your software and then report on that as part of your CI. So these are lines that should be flat if your benchmark has not changed, if your results have not changed. If you can't do that, if that's too hard, like Valgrind will often slow down your program significantly, so it might not be a good option. Um, there's a sort of fallback technique, which is to run the old and the new interleaved. So the idea here is that instead of running your benchmark suite you know, on your main branch when a thing lands, and you save it into a Git repo or a web server or whatever, and then when a new PR comes along, you run the benchmark just for the new stuff, and you compare the absolute numbers. Instead of doing that, when you open a PR, or you know, whatever system you have in place, what actually happens is you compile your main branch and you compile your current branch, and now you have two binaries, and then you alternate running the binaries on the same host basically at the same time. But you're alternating, so they're not actually running concurrently, but you're alternating between them. What this ensures is that if the server room is particularly hot that day, both of the numbers will be affected by that. And so this allows you to more directly compare the results. There is still noise here, um, but there are a bunch of interesting techniques you can do to minimize that noise. You can also use it to reduce outliers in a much more reliable way. There's a, there's a benchmarking crate called Tango that does this pretty well. There's a really good write-up as well about why this works pretty well. There are some restrictions on what you can do with this and how well it works, um, but when you can use it, it's really good. And then you, the sort of last, uh, last option that you have is, if you can't do either of these other two things, is to just try to minimize the noise. This means things like have a dedicated host, make sure that it actually stays pretty reliable over time in terms of temperature, in terms of what else is running on it on the time, which should ideally be nothing, um, in terms of how updated it is when you compare different branches. It's hard, but you can do a bunch of things to try to minimize that noise. The other thing that's important about minimizing noise is to not run your system at capacity. The closer you get to supplying your system with like full load, the higher the chance is that your system like exhibits weird behavior because it's like right at the edge of how much load it can tolerate. So run at a lower load and then see that the performance in terms of time is what you need it to be. And, and I want to stress this point too, that speed is not everything. 
like the number of operations per second, your, your throughput is not the only thing to measure. There are a lot of things that, matter, that might matter to your user, and you should measure all the things that matter. Throughput is a common example, but often what people actually care about is good put. Good put is the amount of actual work you get done over time. So imagine a web server that you're stress testing. You can imagine that the web server detected it was under load and started rejecting requests with like a 500 internal server error. It can return those errors really quickly, right? So you keep supplying more load, and the server just gets faster and faster. Great. But that's not actually what your users care about. They care about how much work gets done. And so you need to be able to reliably check what is the good put of my system and not just what is the throughput. As I mentioned, too, you might have restrictions in terms of memory use. Like maybe you have some upper bound where you know, I cannot use more memory than this. Well, then that should be part of your benchmarks. Maybe latency is what matters. Well, then you should have reliable benchmarks for latency. And, and I want to go one step further here, which is you sometimes want to measure outcomes. This doesn't matter so much if you have like deterministic systems, but if you have anything that does approximation, that does sort of data summarization, does statistics, anything that's machine learning, AI-based, anything that is you know, approximate stuff, um, here you want to measure that the system is sort of within tolerance in its outputs, which has nothing to do with speed. This usually looks something like your benchmark harness simulates a bunch of real-life inputs, um, then it measures the system outputs, and because it simulated the inputs, it knows what the answer should be, and then you check the output of the program against the ground truth, and you see whether the difference is within your tolerance threshold. In general, simple benchmarks lie. If you have a benchmark harness that is simple, it is probably measuring the wrong thing. If you run something in a loop and you get a bigger number, I don't care. And what I mean by that is, if I run it on my machine, it might be inversed. It might have no difference at all. It is really hard to trust benchmarks that are overly simplistic. There are a bunch of things that matter here. How you benchmark matters. Not just in terms of the things we've talked about, but also like the structure of how you generate load. Things like, is your benchmark open, closed, or partly open? If you don't know the difference between these, your benchmark is probably bad. And I don't blame you. Like, Knowing this stuff is non-trivial. There's a really good paper called Open versus Closed, A Cautionary Tale, that talks about the difference between these kinds of benchmarking loops. And it's a really worthwhile lead, uh, read because it talks about how to build representative workloads. How do you make sure that the benchmark exercises your, your application in the same way that real users will, that real load will? Things like, do your, do your clients send a request, wait for a response, and then send a new request? Or do they send requests at a fixed rate or a dynamic rate and asynchronously went for responses? Whether you do one or the other, closed versus open, really changes the kind of output you get of your system and really changes what happens as you crank the load up. You have to think about what bottleneck you really hit. Sometimes your benchmark looks like it gets slower, but it's actually because the generation of inputs in your benchmark becomes the bottleneck. Like, let's say you're like, generating random numbers for your benchmark. Random number generation is not free. And so if you're benchmarking something that's fast enough, you hit the bottleneck of the benchmarking generation of random numbers is now your bottleneck, as you're not measuring your system anymore. The next thing is that what you record out of your benchmarks matter. It's very tempting to just sort of measure the time before, measure the time after, and you take the number of operations you did divided by the time, and that's your output. But what you measured is the mean. There are a bunch of other statistical properties that are worthwhile to measure here. You might talk about the median, right? So the median is nice because it eliminates outliers. The downside of the median is the bunch of stuff it doesn't catch. Like if you have a bimodal distribution where some things are fast, some things are slow, and very few things are in the middle, your median is still going to be in the middle but it doesn't represent the performance profile of your program. You might measure a histogram, right? So even like the top quartile, the bottom quartile, and the middle two, that gives you a little bit more fidelity. You can increase and decrease the size of the buckets according to you know, the data you want to get out. Or you can get a, go to the sort of gold standard of getting a full CDF, which gives a full distribution of your, uh, your measured statistics. But whichever one you choose, you should choose it for a reason. You should choose the one that optimizes the insight you get out of the benchmarks and let you make actionable decision as a result. And finally, how you compare these metrics matters. If you have a benchmarking suite that just outputs a number or a statistic or whatever it might be, 
But the way that you compare whether your PR is faster or slower than your main branch is you just check which number is higher, then that's not reliable either. There's a whole field dedicated to figuring out whether one thing is, is the same or different than something else. It's called statistics. And it's a huge field. It is really, really complicated to get this stuff right. And I don't mean that as a disparaging thing, like you'll never get it right, but just that there's a lot of knowledge here that you can apply to make these things more reliable and more reflective of the real things that matter. And so you need to look into what does it mean for something to be faster or slower than something else. Um, tools like Criterion implement some of these uh, algorithms for figuring out, you know, is this more or less, uh, but it's worth knowing more about. Okay, moving on from benchmarks, um, let's talk about documentation. And I, I'm not talking about the general practice of, of documentation, like writing the sort of public-facing documentation that goes on Docs.rs. There's plenty to be said about that for external-facing docs and how to write comments. Actually, I actually have, have a blog post that will come soon about all of the opinions I have about how to write good code comments, but I'll leave that for another time. But the kind of documentation I'm talking about is like your lead engineer is hit by a bus. If you vanish from the face of the earth, is anything irrecoverable lost? Apart from you, of course, we don't want to lose you. But, but my point is more, is there information that is irrecoverable that you knew that is going to set back the other people who have to pick up where you left off? And, and there are two main points I want to make here. The first here is to document decisions that you've taken. Why does your system work like this? In particular, what alternatives were discarded and why? Which things did you think about doing and then didn't do, and why not? And this matters because if someone comes along later on, they look at your code and they go, why didn't they just do it this way? And then they also end up trying it even though you've already tried it, and then replicate a bunch of the work, and then come hopefully to the same conclusion. Instead, if you write down that you thought about a thing and you decided not to do it, that is valuable information to save work down the line. And similarly, given the path you chose, very few decisions are optimal. There's always some trade-off involved. And you should document the things that you chose to accept, the downsides you know your current system has, but that you want other people to be aware that you were aware at the time were draw drawbacks. This matters because someone might come along later on and say, oh, but this library has now been updated. It doesn't have these problems anymore. Let's try it again. And they should be able to look at which things have actually changed that you thought of, and are there things you thought of that they hadn't. There's, I don't, there's no perfect method for documenting these things. I don't have one. Um, I also don't think the exact mechanism is all that important. The most important thing is to keep these things in mind and make sure they're written down. Um, there are things like ADRs that try to get at this. Um, there's also a variant of them called Y statement ADRs that are much more concise that I quite like that can actually work in code comment form as well. I, I have a tool that I've written that also TBD will probably come out soon um, that we're using internally at Helsing at the moment for basically documenting these kinds of decisions in code. Um, but ultimately, you just need to make sure there's something that captures this information. The second one is related, which is you have to document what's not there. What shortcuts did you take? All of the stuff where there is nothing if you open the code, there, there's like nothing representing the fact that there's not a thing there on purpose. So a good example of this site is stuff like missing handling of corner cases. Like you know that the code doesn't handle like, I don't know, graphs where the number of nodes is odd. It'd be a weird kind of corner case, but let's say you don't handle that. Well, you should probably write down the fact that you don't handle that so that when someone runs into it, they realize. Ideally, you run into it with, by having some check that you know, hits a to-do or an unimplemented that causes a panic so that someone doesn't run into it and then the program just behaves incorrectly. This gets back to the sort of assertion thing. This is an assertion not about the behavior of the code or the assumptions, but about you didn't hit this code path. But even if you have a to-do or unimplemented, those on, a, on their own are not that useful. You want to document why this corner case isn't covered. What even is this corner case? If there's an if and it has an else branch that just says to-do, that doesn't really help me understand why this isn't done or what this else even is. What should go here? Um, there are also a bunch of things that 
I know when I write code, there's a bunch of places where I go, oh, this thing could be made faster. Or maybe we could switch to this smart algorithm here that I just don't have the time to do it now. It doesn't matter right now. It'll only matter when we scale, whatever it might be. You should write those down, those ideas down, because other people can then pick up on them. And again, if you get hit by a bus, that idea is gone if it's not written down somewhere. And then the last one is also really important, which is when you intentionally choose not to implement something, not to add a method that gives you a particular access, not to implement a particular trait. Those things are absent in the code on purpose. And there needs to be something there to tell people not to add it later, because they might look at the code and be like, oh, it'd be so convenient if this thing implemented send, or if this thing implemented from whatever. But if you chose not to do it, write down why. And ideally, you know, this ties back to testing, write a test that will start failing if someone adds that implementation. That's not always trivial, but if you can, it is better than a comment that's never really checked. The next bit here, and this relates to what I just talked about, is misuse resistance. You want to write your software in a way where it's very hard to use it incorrectly, or certainly where it's hard to use it dangerously. Misuse at best means you know, lost time for debugging or lower performance, but at worst it means critical failures when someone uses your software incorrectly. And I really want to stress this point, you're holding it wrong is not acceptable in these settings. It is a very common thing for us to program as programmers to say often more politely, right, that oh, you just need to do it this way instead. But that is just not okay when the, the outcome of someone doing that is a plane crashes or a nuclear reactor blows up, right? Not OK. So you really want to make misuse inexpressible. And this is something Rust is pretty good at, right? We have a type system that is quite expressive. And there's a, there's a talk, I think, earlier today or later today on abusing the type system for fun and profit. And it gets at these kinds of tricks. Some of the ones that I particularly want to call out are new types. So this is not type aliases, but actually new types, so that you can enforce things like no one ever confuses meters with miles, even though they're both U64s and they both end in M. You also want things like type states. So the idea here is that you might have a type, that in this case, let's say it represents like a, like a spaceship or rocket or something. The things you can do to one of those things when it's on the ground and the things you can do to it when it's in the air are different. There are a bunch of things that are common between them. So you might have a shared type rocket, but you actually want to parameterize that type by sort of its current state, its current phase of operation. And then you can implement methods only for rocket ground or only for rocket air and methods for traversing between them. Like launch is a method that would take a rocket ground and return you a rocket air. And so that way, you can statically ensure that certain code paths or certain misuse just cannot happen. There's a talk on typed for safety, I think, on the program as well that goes into this pattern in particular. The next one is, a, is, um, is also sort of related, which is you'll see this in a lot of Rust applications, that they have something like a config type. Right? It's very common. But realistically, the config that you want to like, accept from disk that you're going to toml deserialize or something, is actually pretty different from the representation of a configuration file that you want to have into the runtime of your program. The toml file might have a bunch of extra fields that end up getting computed in some way for runtime. Some of them might be optional, but they're not optional at runtime. They get filled in with something. Really, instead of sharing that type across both and then having a bunch of your code inside of, uh, inside of your real runtime, do things like assert that a field is never none because we know that at this point it must have been set somewhere, right? That's, again, not really OK. And so what you want is to split these kinds of types into the thing that comes from the outside and the thing that's been sanitized and that is ready to be used. And then you have a transition in between them. Because that way you know in the runtime of your program you only ever have these. And you don't need to even have those other paths be represented. The next one is kind of obvious, and it's sort of a, a rule that's existed in C++ land for a long time and many code bases as well, which is you do not have lists of Booleans as arguments to functions. <laughs> even just a single Boolean is probably not OK. Use enums instead. In Rust, we have really nice enums, and you can have each of these enums be a different type with variants that make sense and actually describe what the parameter does. There's no chance of anyone mixing up with what the meaning of true or the meaning of false, and there's no chance of someone putting them in the wrong order. Use types here. Um, 
And then the last one is kind of interesting. So this is um, when you have linked arguments. And what I mean by that is if you have a function that takes two arguments, but when one argument has a certain value, the other argument must also have some property. The simple example here is something like f here takes a Boolean and an option. And if it's the case that either the Boolean is true and then the value is sum, or the Boolean is false and then the, the option is none, if we know that, then this shouldn't be the signature for this function. This function should just take an option, right? Where if it's sum, that implies true. And if it's none, then it implies false. That way, you can't accidentally mess them up and pass you know, true and none. Shouldn't be possible to express. And this can get more advanced, right? So you can think of things like if you s substitute Boolean here for like a U64, imagine that it's only ever sum if the Boolean is 0. Sorry, if the Boolean was a number and is 0. In that case, the real enum here should be something like is zero and has value, and then it has whatever's inside the option, and the other variant is is non-zero and only holds a number, and there's no option. Because that way, you cannot possibly mess up the calling here and have things that are out of sync. It's not always possible to enforce these kind of type tricks. Like there are cases where you run into things that just you just have to check at runtime. Uh, things like uh, cyclical data structures are particularly problematic in this regard. But wherever you can, use the type system to enforce things. Um, and, and a sort of corollary to this is to follow idioms. So even if you can't necessarily statically enforce things, it's really useful to have your code work the way that people think it ought to work. It's much less likely to cause misuse when the user's expectation matches reality. Or to put it the other way around, surprise and misuse go hand in hand. If your user is surprised, that means they've either already made a mistake or were about to make a mistake because the thing didn't work the way they thought. It's really hard to enforce these or even to encourage them. You can have sort of text that tells people and education to tell people. Clippy helps, but it's not a complete solution to this. Um, the Rust API guidelines are a good list of like things you probably should and shouldn't do. Um, but, but again, this is partially just an education problem until we get better tooling. And the last one here is if it smells like a different language. And I, I wish I could describe what Python smells like. <laughs> what Java smells like, <laughs> it's just kind of, you know it when you see it. But the reason I say this, like, if something seems like it's just written in a very object-oriented way, it's not that that's inherently bad. It just means that if you do this in Rust, chances are you're not making use of some feature that Rust has that could ensure better performance, less misuse, those kinds of things. Right? You're probably then forgetting to use iterators, which can give you la lazy execution. Or you're not using guards, which can help ensure that you like, tear down your program correctly. And so it really feels like anytime you feel the smell of a different language, a little alarm bell should go off. Like We're probably leaving something on the table here. Um, and then I want to talk about compatibility. Uh, and, and I mostly hear mean backwards compatibility. Um, you want to make it easy for other parts of your business or you know, partners you work with or consumers or even just internal people who depend on what you build, you want to make it easy for them to update. Stagnation is sort of the root of all evil here, where if you update your thing, you improve the API, you put out some critical bug fix, you want to minimize the friction for others to adopt those and then be more safe, more reliable, more resilient as a result. Uh, and in general, if you don't have a good compatibility story, all the integrations that people have with your code are going to start to fall behind. They're not going to keep up. Um, this mostly matters for reusable components, like, like sort of library crates. But it also matters for anything else, like anything that has an FFI, um, anything that's a binary where people might be executing your binary and assuming that it has a certain calling convention, um, anything that's like a hardware integration where people expect that your thing works on a particular device and then suddenly it stops, anything like this. You really want to think about the forward or the backwards compatibility of your software. Um, and the main thing here, there's sort of two parts. The first one is to how do you write your code in the first place so that it's less likely to break in the future? Um, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, um, but there are a couple of things that I see so often that comes back to bite people. There are more of these than you think, um, but the first of these is concrete types. 
So what I mean by that is if you actually name a type, either in the return type of a function, in the argument type of a function, in, you know, you have a field that's pub, so that type is, is public. If you name a type like vec or hash map or btree map or whatever is 30 JSON value, what that means is you cannot change that type without breaking backwards compatibility. Right? You're now locked into using a hash map in the internal implementation of whatever that thing is forever or having a costly conversion in between. So wherever you can, try to avoid public fields because it commits you to a particular type and try using you know, generics for arguments and infiltrate for return positions to make sure that the thing that you promise the user is um, uh, as non-restrictive on your future code changes as possible. The next one is public dependencies, and this one is sort of related. So if you take dependencies in your pro program, uh, and those dependencies or types from those dependencies leak out into your code's public API. So that could be in argument types, it could be in return types, it could be in structs that are re-exported, but it could also be in traits you implement. Then those are now parts of your backwards compatibility guarantees as well. If you took a dependency on, I don't know, uh, Axums 0 0.6, or, or Hyper might be a good example, like Hyper 0 0.14, and those are part of your public API, what that means is you cannot upgrade to Hyper 1 without breaking your consumers. That might be OK, right? Like maybe this is a particular kind of change where you think it's OK for your users to go through that. But you just be aware that this is a, a thing that you're connecting yourself to for the future now. Um, from implementations are particularly annoying here. So very often what we do when we write libraries is, oh, I want to turn an A into a B. and I, I, I like either I control A or I control B, and so I'm just going to implement from and then use that from implementation everywhere in my code. The problem is trait implementations are always public. You cannot make them private to your crate. So if you implement you know, from 30 JSON value for, or from 30 YAML value uh, for some type that you control, well, now, you can never remove 30 YAML from your dependencies, because doing so would remove that from implementation, which would be a breaking change. Uh, but also, if that crate ever got a new major version, for example, then you couldn't upgrade to it because y if you upgraded, that from would be a different version of value, and now you have a problem. So in general, av avoid implementing things like from uh, for types just because it's convenient, and prefer non-pub inherent methods instead. Just keep in mind the trait implementations are always pub. Generally, the bigger the interface you have for a crate, the, the higher the hazard. You might want to consider stabilizing a simpler core. And you have a bunch of utilities and stuff and convenience methods around. Those can be unstable. You have a core that you keep a small API, very stable, and is easy to upgrade. And keep sort of your security-sensitive logic there, or correctness-sensitive logic there. This is what we see in Git, for example. It has porcelain commands that are specifically intended to be stable over time. It has a bunch of other things that break all the time. Um, and remember that humans miss things. Like these things are hard. You, you, like, I keep discovering new hazards over and over and over again. It is really hard to keep up with this stuff. But you, know, you need to do user education. You need to tell people about these kinds of hazards. But ultimately, you need some kind of automation. Best effort automation is probably all you're going to get at this point. There, there's a lot of tooling that's sort of desperately needed here. Cargo Semmer Checks is a fantastic tool, but its coverage of the kinds of breaking changes that exist is still fairly limited. Um, and so like, if you look at GitHub issue number five for Cargo Semmer Checks, there's a whole list of things that it doesn't catch that it would need to catch before you could rely on it. But even so, having the signal, however weak, is still really valuable. This is a crate called Cargo Public, I, uh, Cargo Public API that uh, lets you explore your public API and then diff them across versions of your crate. It's a really useful tool for humans just to see what's changed, um, but it's not inherently a tool that's going to sort of save your bacon here. It requires a human to go look. OK, we're almost at the end. Um, and again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is what I mean by. This stuff is hard and costly. Choose where to spend your effort. Um, so I gave a, a pretty sort of I gave a talk last year with a significant focus on things like dependencies and upgrades. This is the living with Rust long term talk. Um, so I'm not going to go too much over dependencies and upgrades and the like, but I do want to stress one and a half 
main points. Knowledge is everything when it comes to dependencies. If you don't know exactly which version of exactly which dependency all the way down is deployed on what device at all points in time, you have a problem. Because you don't know where you might have a problem. You don't know where, like if there's a security disclosure for some crate, you don't know whether that affects you. And it's not sufficient to just track what you're currently using. It's not sufficient to just look at the cargo lock that is in your current main branch. It matters what was built into the things that have been deployed and haven't been updated since. You need to track the entire closure here over time. And this is because you might learn about a compromise after the fact. You might now learn that, like, I don't know, uh, SQLite version 339.2 from like several years ago has a compromise. You need to figure out whether you might have been compromised at the time, which requires that historical data. It also obviously needs to be untamperable, right? So that people can't just overwrite your historical data. That would be bad. It should be append only. But, but there's sort of a, a sequence of operations here, or a, a, a ladder you can climb in terms of how good this information is. You start with healthy skepticism. Right? Taking dependencies is risky. It's a calculated risk. We don't want to go back to the world where you had to write everything yourself, but you should have some skepticism. The next one is tracking everything. Like I mentioned, you want the complete dependency closure and every deployment, every device. Once you have that, you then want to start connecting it to known issues. This is stuff like CVE databases, RustSec databases, so that if a new known issue is reported somewhere, you are alerted that you have a problem and where that problem is. This is sort of, you can think of this as sort of an ongoing join between your knowledge graph and the vulnerability databases. And then the next step is to start vetting for unknown issues. This requires like humans or tools to go look at source code and find new problems. Um, there are tools that help with this, things like CargoVet. You could have your, in, um, your own internal database for CargoVet where like, someone at your company has looked at this code. Or you could have a public one that maybe you contribute back to or you just leech off of. Um, but, but in either case, you want to have some way to track which things have, has someone I trust looked at. And then again, you want to join that with this so that you know where your areas of risk are. It's just important that you know where the risk is. That is sort of the, the primary thing here. It might be tempting looking at this to be like, oh, we should just write everything ourselves. There's a huge risk in that too. If you write all of the software yourself, you're on the hook for updating it. If, you're, if you have a logic bug in there, if you have a dependency bug in there, you have to be the one to go fix it. No one's going to fix it for you. Um, and, and so this is like, you, you often want to take the dependency instead. Um, and, and the sort of, Point five point here is that you want to make stagnation, like falling behind, a recurrent choice. That is, it should be okay to fall behind. Like, we all have jobs to do. Um, but you should be aware that you are behind. And you should be required to reaffirm that you want to be behind on a regular basis. And the reason for this is because it's really costly to get back up to speed. It's not linear in the amount of time. Every time you choose to stay behind, you might fall another major version behind. Or you might fall another sort of significant deprecation behind. And usually it's much easier to just follow each incremental step of a library than trying to do these major jumps all in one go. Uh, you want to do this in two ways. The first one is to have loud reminders whenever you're behind like whenever there's a dependency that has a new version, but also whenever you have dependencies that are dead. You are on the latest version, but the latest version is seven years old. Right? This is a thing that you should be aware of and should be required to reaffirm periodically because it is an ongoing risk. Uh, and you also want to reduce the friction to catching up. This means things like you know, Dependabot or Renovate for auto-merging bump PRs. Um, it means things like having an actual budget for your team in terms of time, like as a part of your regular roadmap, to do maintenance work, to do this kind of update work. Don't just have it be a thing that people have to find time to do. Uh, you want to make sure you upstream changes. If you have a fork of some dependency, you're behind and you're going to stay behind forever. You want to upstream them so that you can get back on the regular release train. 
And if you have a dependency that does change very, very regularly, you want to wrap it in some way so that when the dependency updates, which is like, let's say it has frequent breaking changes, you want to make sure that those changes only require you to change a small thing, and then all your other things just get the update for free because they were only using your, your wrapper that might simplify the API a lot, for example. Now, there's a lot of interplay between these, right? So you don't want to be loud about something if an auto-merge PR just hasn't landed yet. You don't want to warn people if the automation can take care of the problem. But you also don't want to auto-merge something if, for example, it's going to introduce a breaking change because that dependency was actually a public dependency. So this stuff is not trivial, but at least now you know some of the things to keep track of. This applies to Rust C itself, by the way. Like you, you want to keep your Rust version up to date in a similar kind of way. And it has the same cost. The longer you fall behind, the more things you haven't kept up with. OK. Those are all the things I'm going to tell you about today. There are more, uh, but I'll, I'll leave you with a sort of a, a list of some of the things that it takes um, to, that you can sort of record in your memory, maybe. Um, feel free to come up to me afterwards and ask about other things and also how painful this actually is. Um, but, but notice that I didn't mention unsafe here, for example. Unsafe is obviously a concern, but it's sort of orthogonal, right? It's just if you need to use unsafe, then you use unsafe, and then you still have all these problems. I didn't mention certification, not because it isn't a problem or a concern or a thing to think about, but it's also mostly orthogonal to the kind of techniques and tools that you need to have, regardless of how certified your compiler is. With that, thank you for listening, and uh, you have five minutes left. <laughs>